Chapter Two of the Book of Snobs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gates Maru. The Book of Snobs by William Makepeace Thackeray. Chapter Two, The Snob Royal. Long since, at the commencement of the reign of her present gracious Majesty, it chanced. On a fair summer evening, as Mr. James would say, the three or four young cavaliers were drinking a cup of wine after dinner at the hostelry called the King's Arms, kept by Mistress Anderson in the royal village of Kensington. Twas a balmy evening, and the wayfarers looked out on a cheerful scene. The tall elms of the ancient gardens were in full leaf, and countless chariots of the nobility of England whirled by to the neighboring palace. Where princely Sussex, whose income latterly only allowed him to give tea parties, entertained his royal niece at a state banquet. When the caroches of the nobles had set down their owners at the banquet hall, their varlets and servitors came to quaff a flagon of nut brown ale in the King's Arms gardens hard by. We watched these fellows from our lattice. By Saint Boniface, 'twas a rare sight. The tulips in Mynheer von Dunck's gardens were not more gorgeous than the liveries of these pie-coated retainers. All the flowers of the field bloomed in their ruffled bosoms. All the hues of the rainbow gleamed in their plush breeches, and the long caned ones walked up and down the gardens with that charming solemnity, that delightful quivering swagger of the calves, which has always had a frantic fascination for us. The walk was not wide enough for them, as the shoulder knots strutted up and down it in canary and crimson and light blue. Suddenly, in the midst of their pride, a little bell was rung, a side door opened, and after setting down the royal mistress, Her Majesty's own crimson footman with epaulets and black plushes came in. It was pitiable to see the other poor John slink off at this arrival. Not one of the honest private plushes could stand up before the royal flunkies. They left the walk. They sneaked into dark holes and drank their beer in silence. The royal plush kept possession of the garden until the royal plush dinner was announced, when it retired, and we heard from the pavilion where they dined conservative cheers and speeches and Kentish fires. The other flunkies we never saw more. My dear flunkies, so absurdly conceited at one moment and so abject the next, are but the types of their masters in this world. He who meanly admires mean things is a snob. Perhaps that is a safe definition of the character. And this is why I have, with the utmost respect, ventured to place the snob royal at the head of my list. Causing all others to give way before him, as the flunkies before the royal representative in Kensington Gardens, to say of such and such a gracious sovereign that he is a snob is but to say that his Majesty is a man. Kings too are men and snobs. In a country where snobs are in the majority, a prime one surely cannot be unfit to govern. With us, they have succeeded to admiration. For instance. James the First was a snob, and a Scotch snob, than which the world contains no more offensive creature. He appears to have had not one of the good qualities of a man, neither courage nor generosity nor honesty nor brains. But read what the great divines and doctors of England said about him. Charles the Second, his grandson, was a rogue, but not a snob. Whilst Louis the Fourteenth, his old square toes of a contemporary, the great worshipper of big wiggery, has always struck me as a most undoubted and royal snob. I will not, however, take instances from our own country of royal snobs, but refer to a neighboring kingdom, that of Brentford, and its monarch, the late great and lamented Gorgius the Fourth. With the same humility with which the footmen at the King's Arms gave way before the plush royal, 
the aristocracy of the brentford nation bent down and truckled before gorgius and proclaimed him the first gentleman in europe and it's a wonder to think what is the gentlefolk's opinion of a gentleman when they gave gorgius such a title what is it to be a gentleman is it to be honest to be gentle to be generous to be brave to be wise and possessing all these qualities to exercise them in the most graceful outward manner ought a gentleman to be a loyal son a true husband and honest father ought his life to be decent his bills to be paid his tastes to be high and elegant his aims in life lofty and noble in a word ought not the biography of a first gentleman in europe to be of such a nature that it might be read in young ladies schools with advantage and studied with profit in the seminaries of young gentlemen i put this question to all instructors of youth to mrs ellis and the women of england to all schoolmasters from dr hawtrey down to mr squeers i conjure up before me an awful tribunal of youth and innocence attended by its venerable instructors like the ten thousand red-cheeked charity children in st paul's sitting in judgment and gorgeous pleading his cause in the midst out of court out of court fat old florizel beadles turn out that bloated pimple-faced man if gorgeous must have a statue in the new palace which the brentford nation is building it ought to be set up in the flunkey's hall he should be represented cutting out a coat in which art he is said to have excelled he also invented maraschino punch a shoe buckle this was in the vigor of his youth and the prime force of his invention and a chinese pavilion the most hideous building in the world he could drive a four in hand very nearly as well as the brighton coachman could fence elegantly and it is said played the fiddle well and he smiled with such irresistible fascination that persons who were introduced into his august presence became his victims body and soul as a rabbit becomes the prey of a great big boa constrictor i would wager that if mr widdicombe were by a revolution placed on the throne of brentford people would be equally fascinated by his irresistibly majestic smile and tremble as they knelt down to kiss his hand if he went to dublin they would erect an obelisk on the spot where he first landed as the paddylanders did when gorgeous visited them we have all of us read with delight that story of the king's voyage to haggisland where his presence inspired such a fury of loyalty and where the most famous man of the country the baron of bradwardine coming on board the royal yacht and finding a glass out of which gorgeous had drunk put it into his coat pocket as an inestimable relic and went ashore in his boat again but the baron sat down upon the glass and broke it and cut his coat-tails very much and the inestimable relic was lost to the world for ever o oh, noble bradwardine what old-world superstition could set you on your knees before such an idol as that if you want to moralize upon the mutability of human affairs go and see the figure of gorgeous in his real identical robes at the waxwork admittance one shilling children and flunkies sixpence go and pay sixpence end of chapter two